public service. Here's a look at how economic conditions are affecting health care coverage and biomedical research. The House Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee hears from a panel that includes Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano and company executives. This is two hours. The meeting of the subcommittee is called to order, and today we are having a hearing on treatments for an ailing economy, protecting health care coverage, and investing in biomedical research. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and I'll recognize myself initially for an opening statement. Medicaid, as you know, provides 59 million Americans with access to medical care and specialized support and services. It protects our most vulnerable populations, the poor, disabled, and elderly. It also accounts for nearly half of all nursing home care. The NIH is America's leading medical research agency and the foremost biomedical research institute in the world. It's through the work of NIH that we are living longer and healthier lives and may someday soon find cures for the epidemics of our time, like cancer and diabetes. And it will be through the NIH that we're protected from those that wish us harm through bioterrorism. No doubt the effects of the current economic crisis are on the forefront of everyone's mind. Americans are facing uncertain times and wondering how they are going to pay for basic necessities like food, fuel, and health care. Others are just hoping to hold on until they are lucky enough to find a job. And as this crisis hits both Wall Street and Main Street, Washington must act because the situation in the states, as I know we are going to hear from Governor Napolitano, is certainly dire. Due to shrinking state revenue, states may cut coverage and restrict new enrollment, which means millions of Americans may lose access to the health care coverage they desperately need, and those who have lost their jobs will lose health care coverage also. Right now, more than 10 million people are actively seeking work but unable to find it. The unemployment rate is 6.5 percent, which is the highest level since 1994. And each month this year, our economy has shed more jobs than it has created. To date, 1.2 million jobs have been lost. A study conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation found that increasing the national unemployment rate by one percentage point increases Medicaid and S-CHIP enrollment by one million people. Such a change would increase state spending by approximately $1.4 billion at a time when states are already struggling to balance their budgets. And to make matters worse, due to state Medicaid programs, not only, they not only impact Medicaid eligible individuals with the cuts, but they also adversely affect the health care job market. Medicaid cuts translate into health care job losses. Therefore, such cuts only contribute to the state's unemployment rate and can exacerbate a worsening fiscal crisis. Now, earlier this year, I introduced a bill with my colleagues, Chairman Dingell, Mr. King, and Mr. Reynolds, to temporarily increase each state's federal medical assistance percentage, what we call FMAP, during this economic downturn to ensure that states can continue to provide critical services instead of cutting them. A similar provision was included in the recovery package that the House passed in September, and I hope that this FMAT increase will be included in any economic recovery package that is crafted during a possible lame duck session, which, as you know, may occur, uh, is likely to occur next week. As we explore the possibility of another economic recovery package, we should also discuss providing additional assistance to states in creating jobs by investing in biomedical innovation and research. While there is no question regarding the importance of the research NIH conducts to improve our health, it also provides real direct economic benefits at the local level, including increased employment, growth opportunities for universities, medical centers, local companies, and additional economic stimulus for the community. In 2007, NIH grants and contracts created and supported more than 350,000 jobs that generated wages in excess of $18 billion in the 50 states. And these are good paying jobs. The average wage was $52,000 a year. According to Families USA, if the amount NIH awards to the states were to increase by 6.6 percent, the national economic benefit would add up to $3.1 billion worth of new business activity, 9,185 additional jobs, and $1.1 billion in new wages. We have a proud tradition in this country of, pers of persevering through tough times by investing in American innovation and ingenuity. What better way is there to tap into that great American spirit and industry than by investing in research to combat disease and lead the world in that noble endeavor? At a time of great economic uncertainty, Washington, in my opinion, must act. 
Last month, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke voiced his support for an economic recovery package during testimony here on Capitol Hill. Some economists are saying that we need to pass a more robust package. I was reading Mr. Sterling's testimony. I think he talked figures three, four hundred billion dollars. Each day we hear about more job losses and troubling economic trends. I would hope these headlines would serve as a wake-up call at the White House. House Democrats are prepared to work with President Bush and the Senate to pass another economic recovery package, probably last week, if the President finally recognizes the need for such action. And I would like to thank each of our witnesses for being here today. I especially would like to welcome Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano. I told her uh, before that uh, I have a lot of relatives. I don't know, it seems like people from New Jersey, when they retire, are uh, often going to Arizona. So I've been out there a lot to see my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law. Thanks for being here today. Uh, also nice to see Gene Sperling, who's been to many of our message meetings over the last year to, to talk about um, you know, where we're going on, on various economic issues. But I, do, I look forward to hearing from all the testimony from all of our panelists today, and now recognize uh, Mr. Burgess, who is our ranking member for the day. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief because we do have a lot of witnesses to go through today. Uh, and I have an opening statement that is prepared and I will submit it for the record. But I, I am grateful that we have such a varied panel of witnesses here in front of us today. I think it uh, always speaks well for this committee that we do have uh, such varied witnesses come and speak to us. I am a little concerned. I am grateful to uh, be able to meet the, the acting head of the National Institute of Health, but other than that individual, we have no practicing physician. We, even with that individual, we have no practicing physician in front of us. And I, I think it would be good to hear from a member of the provider community as we tackle these tough issues because they are obviously impacted and any increase or in funding or any growth of the state Medicaid programs is obviously going to affect our physician communities across the country in ways that most of us, frankly, do not understand or do not care to understand. We heard from a pediatrician from Alabama last year who uh, got my attention because she wanted to practice the same year that I did, 1981. So now, after nearly 30 years of medical school residency and practice, she had a practice that was 70 percent Medicaid and was borrowing from her retirement fund to keep her office open because, as we all know, Medicaid pays about 30 to 40 percent of the cost of delivering the care. And I will tell you from my past as a practicing physician that if you're losing a little bit of money on each patient, it becomes very, very difficult to make it up in volume. One of the great concerns we had during the S-CHIP expansion arguments last year was the fact that moving children off of private insurance onto S-CHIP was subsequently going to have a very deleterious effect on, on the practicing pediatrician. We heard testimony in this committee earlier in the fall from uh, Mr. Jim Frog from the Center for Health Transformation who asked if we were going to give more money into the system, which maybe we needed to do, but we shouldn't give more money without asking for increased transparency and accountability. Now, we always at this committee are quick to harshly judge the physician community for being slow adopters on electronic medical records. but. I recall back in 1996 being required to purchase all kinds of computer equipment to, uh, that was for the, because electronic claim submission was now going to be required. In fact, that's what led to the HIPAA regulations that we now live with every day. But at the same time, there is no mechanism across the states for a hospital to identify who is responsible for coverage for a patient. As a consequence, we end up with a situation where a Medicaid patient may also be eligible to be covered by their private insurance, but no one knows because that information is not readily available. And as a consequence, the Medicaid system itself uh, unfairly has to pay for that, that rightly should be paid by a private insurance company, and the hospital and physician are reimbursed again at that 30 percent of the cost of delivering care that Medicaid provides. And then the other issue that we're not addressing today and that really you know, just cries out for us to address is the issue of the lack of efficiency and, and, and the presence of fraud within the system. The GAO has uncovered this. Uh, New York Times article, and albeit this is several uh, months old, from July of 05, quoting here, New York's Medicaid program, once a beacon of the great society, has become so huge, so complex, so lightly policed that it is easily exploited. This is the New York Times. Again quoting, though the program is a vital resource for 4.2 million people 
who rely on it for their health care, a year-long investigation by the Times found that the program has been misspending billions of dollars annually because of fraud, waste, and profiteering. A computer analysis of several million records obtained under the Freedom of Information Act revealed numerous indications of fraud and abuse, and the state had never investigated. Now, they go on to say later in the article, uh, New York's Medicaid problem is, uh, program is by far the most expensive and the most generous in the nation. It spends nearly twice the national average, roughly $10,600. And that's more than any other state on each of its 4.2 million recipients, one of every five New Yorkers. And that was from 2005. I suspect that number would be a little higher today. The Kaiser Family Foundation last fall said that the average employer insurance uh, uh, Employer-sponsored insurance is $8,800. We could buy everyone a gold-plated insurance policy in New York on the Medicaid program for what we're spending today. And at the very least, our providers would be reimbursed more fairly, and, uh, and, and perhaps we would have uh, less providers leaving the system. I am grateful that we have uh, some representatives from the private sector here today. I am especially interested in hearing uh, the uh, comments that I read in the testimony about association health plans. Uh, certainly, we have multi-state corporations that are allowed to sell insurance across state lines, but we don't give the same break to the little guy, and I frankly do not understand that. In the NFL, for example, if a player is traded from Washington to Dallas, two months ago I would have said it was an upgrade, but nevertheless, if a player is traded from Washington to Dallas, their insurance goes with them. If a fan follows his favorite player from Washington to Dallas, he's got to start all over again. And that's a fundamental unfairness of our insurance system, and really it is the obligation of this Congress or the next Congress to correct that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. I like the uh, football analogies. Um, next, recognized for an opening statement, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I appreciate the football analogy also. And, uh, but since I'm from Houston, I wouldn't want anybody to be traded to Dallas. Uh, but I'd be glad to talk about the uh, transferability of state-regulated insurance. But I, I know Governor DiPolitano, having served 20 years in the state legislature in Texas and dealing with state health insurance, uh, I'm not so sure folks living in Arizona would be best served by our state agency regulating the policies that are sold in Arizona. Uh, but with that, I'll be glad to let me get into my remarks. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding the hearing today. As we know, the current economic state in this country is taking its toll national and the state level. Many individuals are losing their jobs, and the rate of unemployment is rising as is the number of uninsured in our country, adding to the 46 million uninsured we already have in the U.S. Unfortunately, when individuals lose their job, they often cannot afford medical care and offer for, often forego it. This leads them to allowing medical problems worsening and these individuals showing up in emergency rooms when their problems are much worse and more costly to treat and placing a larger burden on the system because they're uninsured. During the last economic turndown in 2003, President Bush provided a 2.5 increase in the state's federal medical assistance percentage to help assist them in the rising number of individuals needing Medicaid, Medicaid coverage. In turn, the states agreed not to reduce their current standards for Medicaid eligibility. In order to avoid state deficits, many states will reduce their standards for Medicaid eligibility, which will actually increase the number of uninsured. An increase in the FMAP funding would avert this potential problem and allow states to continue to provide Medicaid coverage to its uninsured population. I have supported the providing the increase in FMAP in the past. In fact, Chairman Pallone introduced H.R. 5268, which would have increased FMAP by 2.95 percent, and I supported that bill. I also support increased NIH funding. The NIH, the world's leading biomedical research institute, is one of the great success stories of the federal government. Our investment in life-saving research has led to advances that have profoundly improved the length and quality of life of millions of Americans. For information gained from NIH research is revolutionizing the practice of medicine and future directions of scientific inquiry. Without a doubt, the work performed in, at the NIH is invaluable. The groundbreaking research supported by NIH has provided a lifeline of hope to countless Americans, whether it be diabetes, cancer, HIV, AIDS, and many other illnesses. 
Unfortunately, for the fifth year, consecutive year, NIH has received flat funding. The NIH employs thousands of researchers and generates wages in excess of 18 billion in 50 states. The economic benefit of funding the NIH is something that could help both the states and our medical research. While funding the NIH and increasing FMAP are not the answer to our financial situation, they are health care related funding that can provide relief to the states. It is my hope that if Congress moves and economic stimulus next week that includes both FMAP increase and additional NIH funding. And again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for uh, calling this very timely hearing if we have a lame duck session next week. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next for an opening statement, are we going to get the uh, Nashville music analogies? Because well, I know last I, night I you could had sit you. here and give you lots of wonderful Nashville music analogies. The Tennessee, uh, the CMAs were last night, the Country Music Awards were last night. And if you missed the show, you missed a tremendous show. And Kid Rock came out wearing a Titans jersey, which I thought was terrific. He, he had a great presentation. And I will, to my colleague from the Houston area, sorry you lost your Oilers, but your Tennessee Titans are now just having the greatest year that they have had. And to the guys from Dallas, all the Texans are coming back to Tennessee. Wouldn't have been a Texas without us. So everything, <coughs> everything Madam Chairman, the General Lady, around, you'll, I, really uh, I will I yield. I started this. With, huh? It's my with, fault. Uh, great sympathy, I will yield. <laughs> Well, being a country western fan, I'm glad George Strait, a good Texan, is still at the top in this, uh, the King of CMA. But I also know I gave away all my Orler paraphernalia to a <laughs> predecessor from Nashville and said, okay, we wanted to, we ended up keeping the owner and you got the team. Uh, it was supposed to be reversed. Y'all were supposed to get the owner and we kept the team. But uh, congratulations on the Titans. Reclaiming success. my time. The Texans Euler, are rebuilding every year. Your Euler <laughs> paraphernalia could probably be sold on eBay and you could uh, reap a tidy sum. And uh, George Strait is the king of country right now, but uh, the goodness in his career has happened out of that wonderful Nashville creative community. So we welcome all Texans to Tennessee. And we welcome all of our uh, guests here today coming in. We thank you uh, for taking time to come before us and to work with us on this issue. We are all concerned about health care and the economy and the interface of the two and preserving that access to health care. And Mr. Chairman, you know, I, as we're talking about spending more money, I find it very interesting that over the past year, the administration and the Democrat-led Congress has chosen to spend about a trillion dollars bailing out financial institutions and then after having waived the PAYGO rules, uh, the Democrat-led Congress spent uh, $283 billion in, in new spending and we know that has not been the cure for uh, the economy. As we look at health care and the relationship between what is one-seventh of our nation's economy and the economic structure that we have. Uh, the chairman spoke uh, very appropriately about the spirit of industry, the American spirit of industry that exists in this country. And our focus should be on what we do to energize that spirit of industry because we are the most creative people on the planet. We seek ways to solve problems that are laid in front of us, and we are very good at it. And what the decisions that we make should be here to energize and create the right growth environment for small businesses, for science and medical research firms to solve some of the problems that we have, for technology firms to, dis to solve some of the problems of data transfer and of, um, of records that can be kept and owned by individuals. And I would hope that we, as we look at tax policies and how it applies to health care, how it applies to innovation, that we are going to do that. I will say, Mr. Chairman, I was a little bit concerned to learn that judiciary is looking at moving intellectual property away from a subcommittee and just having it considered by the full committee. 
because intellectual property is the basis of which all these innovators that are going to solve the health IT problems, the biomedical research problems that are going to deal with how industry provides health care for employees, they find their basis in that. So my hope is that as we look at the interface between health care and that being a seventh of our economy, that our course of action is not going to be throw some money at it and wait for government to solve it, but our focus is going to be how we address the needs, the health care needs of individuals and create the right environment so that indeed innovators can innovate and find a way to help solve some of the health care issues, uh, the health IT issues, the access issues that exist today. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Before we uh, proceed to the panel, let me ask uh, unanimous consent to include in the record, first, a statement of the American Hospital Association, and second, two letters from the National Governors Association supporting a temporary increase in FMAP and a new report released by the uh, National Governors Association today on economic recovery. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, that completes our opening statements. And uh, we're going to turn to our witnesses and our first panel. I want to welcome all of you. And let me introduce the, the first panel here. First uh, is the Honorable Janet Napolitano, who is the governor of the state of Arizona. And next is Gene Sperling, who is the senior fellow for the Center for American Progress Action Fund. And then we have Mr. Craig Zolotro, uh, a Medicaid beneficiary from uh, Maryland. And then we have uh, Mr. Raymond Pinard, president and chief executive officer of 48 Hour Print, which is, uh, he's from Boston. And last is Dr. Alan Viard, who's a resident scholar with the American Enterprise Institute here in uh, Washington. Uh, we have five-minute opening statements. Um, they become part of the hearing record, but each of you may, in the discretion of the committee, submit additional brief and pertinent statements in writing for inclusion uh, in the record. And I'll start uh, with uh, the governor. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Given the colloquy that just occurred, I have to put in a word for the Arizona Cardinals. We're four games ahead in the division, and we look forward to meeting Tennessee later on in the year. Um, and I'm here to testify about FMAP. Uh, I am the two-term governor of Arizona, and the reason I mention that is because I was governor the last time Congress addressed FMAP in the context of state deficits, so I can speak directly to its effect on medical care in our states and also its effect on our state economies. Uh, there are two different uh, issues pending before the Congress where states are concerned, two major ones today. In another committee, they are hearing testimony on the need to invest in physical infrastructure, on projects that are ready to go, that have cleared all the environmental impact statement requirements and the like, as a means of stimulating jobs and job creation. Uh, that is very important, and the governors, uh, on a bipartisan basis, are in support of that. The letter you just incorporated in the record from the National Governors Association, which is a bipartisan organization as well, addresses FMAP, uh, which is another major issue. And it deals, of course, with the federal share of Medicaid payments. Uh, this is a very, very easy and efficient way for the federal government to work in partnership with the states uh, to make sure that health care continues to be provided to most in need and indeed in a way is its own economic stimulus into the health care provider community. Uh, let me give you a sense of what the, the condition of the states is today. Uh, 49 states are required by law to have balanced budgets every year. Approximately 30 states now are already in deficit. Uh, we expect by the end of the year that will rise to 40 states. They expect cumulative deficits of over $140 billion by fiscal 2010. State fiscal years are different than federal. State fiscal years are generally July 1 to June 30 as opposed to the October 1 federal year. Uh, the states have been in this uh, position now uh, for some uh, period of time. So any easy options available to them have been exhausted. Uh, I'll use Arizona as an example. 
Uh, Arizona was one of the first states to experience the er economic downturn because of the heavy prevalence of the housing industry in our state. Uh, during the last few years, we had set aside money for a rainy day fund. We had $750 million set aside to use in case of an economic downturn. Um, by the end of our next special session, we will have totally depleted uh, that fund. Uh, it is also important to note that state budget deficits uh, tend to lag behind recovery. Uh, so that uh, whatever you do today, it needs to be done in the context of a, of a timing cycle. It needs to be a, a two-year approach and not simply a one-year approach. Now, uh, let me turn directly to Medicaid with my remaining few minutes. Um, an increase in the federal Medicaid match uh, allows us to do two things. Uh, one is uh, it recognizes that when uh, state economies are hurt, when revenues are down, um, the en demand for enrollment in Medicaid goes up. More people simply become eligible. You are not expanding eligibility. You are not changing your program in any way whatsoever. You just simply have more people who aren't making as much money as they used to. By way of example, in September of this year, 13,000 more Arizonans qualified for, for Medicaid than in August. Um, about eight months ago, we had 900,000 people on Medicaid in Arizona. Now we are approaching 1.15 million. Uh, that is a very tremendous rate of growth. Uh, in addition, uh, what, what you find is if you provide an FMAP uh, correction now, you compensate for the way FMAP is calculated. As you know, FMAP is calculated with a three-year rolling average. And what that means is that you really you have states that are currently in deficit now that are actually seeing their FMAPs decreased because they are experiencing the, the effect of the rollover average. Uh, and so, uh, by way of example, uh, you have at least nine states that next month will experience a decrease in their FMAP percentage even though they currently are in deficit. Uh, and so, by looking at FMAP now, you can assist states with uh, keeping on the rolls those who, who need health care. You can provide health care dollars into uh, the health care system. Uh, and you can uh, make sure that, that states who are already, have already used up their easy options do not uh, have to either raise taxes or cut other spending in order to cover Medicaid, which in a period of recession would be contraindicated. That would add to the recession, not help our nation get out of the recession. So the nation's governors uh, believe that this is an appropriate time to uh, reemphasize FMAP. This is it's an easy calculation to do. It's efficient. You don't need to invent a new program. We know it works. We've done it before. Uh, and the period of need or the, the need for this couldn't be more serious than the present time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Sperling. Uh, I guess in the spirit of this hearing, um, I have to note that I was born and raised in Michigan. My family still lives there. I am a Detroit Lion fan. Um, <laughs> We are 0 and 8. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, speaking, if I may. Yes. I know about Thank you for yielding, Congressman. <laughs> I started it. I'm so glad that, that you do, and we welcome so many Michiganders who have moved to Spring Hill, Tennessee, the southern <laughs> area of my district. They're welcomed. They're at home there, and the Spring Hill Saturn plan is doing very well, and we're converting them daily to Titan fans. Yield back. Uh, well, uh, uh, her uh, undefeated team plays my winless uh, team on uh, Thanksgiving. Um, Michigan, University of Michigan, which is usually our bright spot, is three and seven. So I'm collectively three and fifteen for the football season. I hope that will be seen as a sign of character and loyalty, and not poor judgment that would make you disregard the rest of my statement. Um, <laughs> I think we have to start with the notion that we are in a demand crisis. And I think with the headlines every day on how the TARP is working, the financial crisis, liquidity crisis, the capital market crisis is all appropriate. But I, I think we have to have an adjustment in our thinking. We have a demand crisis. And what I mean by that is that as important it is, as it is to fix our capital market crisis, it will not do the trick if nobody wants to buy or spend or borrow or expand. 
In my professional life, I have never been more worried about a coming economic year than the next year. The overwhelming amount of spending that has happened the last seven years has been driven off people extracting equity from their home mortgages with rising prices. That energy is depleted. It is gone. But what scares me the most is I've never seen a moment where when you look out at the private sector and the American consumer and even the global economy, I can't see where demand is coming from next year. In October, tens of millions of American families recognized that they had taken a significant hit in their home prices, in their home wealth, and their mortgage wealth. Among the tens of millions of American families having conversations around their kitchen table right now, there is only one conversation going on. What are we going to cut back on? That may make sense for every single family, but if 50 million families are making that decision at once, that's going to hurt spending, and the businesses who see that are going to project that and lay people off, and you're going to have that downward cycle. We were hopeful before that with a weak dollar that we might get a burst from manufacturing exports to the rest of the world that would hopefully be growing. There was a little while where that looked like that might be promising. Those hopes are dashed. The dollar's up. Europe is projecting virtually no growth, all of Europe. Uh, the IMF is almost projecting a global recession. Um, and exports in the last few months, manufacturing in the last few months, has gone to some of the lowest, the, the greatest falls we've seen. So the question is, what is going to jumpstart this economy? I think in my, again, in my professional life, I have never seen a moment where I thought there was a greater case for a very large fiscal stimulus. And let me say, I understand that that would be subject to political attack. I understand that. I understand that we have an extremely high deficit, and for one year that would make the deficit higher. But I don't see where else the demand's coming from. And I encourage people to put aside the preconceptions and think about what I call the Powell Doctrine approach to stimulus, to come at this with overwhelming force. Because the risk of being too slow, too small, too incremental are so much greater for our people than the risks of, of being too bold for a year. The pain of 8 or 9 percent unemployment for a year or two years would be far too great for our economy and would end up hurting the deficit even worse. I think as we look forward, we need to have not only a bigger stimulus, we need to be tough on stimulus, we need to make sure that it's actually measures that get out during the period that will increase demand. But I think as Governor Napolitano said, we need to probably look at a longer window. We need to make sure that we're looking at how to get demand going over probably an 18 month or even longer period. I think this also means we should be looking for those areas where, where those short-term investments are win-wins. They're also down payments on long-term priorities. When possible, that should be our aspiration. Now, I believe that in that context, uh, a significant increase in the FMAP uh, makes an enormous amount of sense. Because I think that if you're trying to expand growth, to have federal policies that ignore that as you're giving money with one hand, states are being forced to not only cut back on health care, but to contract, to lay off people, to raise taxes, is, is to have a, a, a policy that is going to lead to contraction at the state level. Increasing the FMAP is one of the quickest ways to inject demand. It helps the people who are often the innocent victims of the recession who have lost their health care. And I think it, it is one of the most important things that we can do for demand and keeping states out of this, I think, very bad choice they will face, which is either to restrict the Medicaid uh, coverage and see more people lose their health care, moving our country backwards, or to protect that and then have to cut back and do painful cuts or tax increases that will be harmful to the economy and their people in other ways. I believe that a, a very significant FMAP uh, increase of, of, of over of $35 billion is justified in this context. And I, again, I ask people to look at how risky the economy is last year and not look through this through its normal lens. I would never have been here in the previous two discussions on stimulus talking about this much. 
I think we're just in a very, very different situation. I also believe that if you were doing an S-chip expansion, that while a permanent S-chip expansion should have offsets to ensure that it protects against the deficit going up, in the short term, for the first couple of years or so, it would again make sense to do this, to waive those pay-fors so that you're getting the full stimulative effect possible. Um, and then finally, I would just say that I would not let any of this prevent us from going forward on universal health care reform that includes with it the kind of tough measures that would also, and smart measures, that would help us bring down our long-term health care costs. I think that is the way that we can marry an increase for a year or two uh, uh, to help in this, deficit, in, in this period of recession with a long-term strategy to not only cover all Americans, but start bringing down national health care cost growth, which is the best way to bring down the larger cost of Medicare and Medicaid growth, which was, is obviously our greatest long-term entitlement challenge. Thank you. Thank you, really, for your uh, testimony. And I, we're going to have some follow-up questions later specifically on some of the points you mentioned. Uh, Mr. I think your name is actually spelled wrong there. It's, Zala, it's Zaltorov, right? Zalatoro. Zalatoro. Z-O-L-O-T-O-R-O-W. Oh, so it is correct it's, there. It's right there, yeah. All right. Thanks. We'll recognize you for an opening statement. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Good morning, and thank you to Chairman Pallone. Ranking Member Deal and members of the subcommittee for having this hearing and for inviting me to speak to you today. I come before this committee as a proud and grateful enrollee in Maryland's Medicaid program. I am a student at Howard Community College. Right now I am only taking one class, but I also work at the school newspaper as an advertising manager, copy editor, and staff writer. I hope to major in journalism so that one day I can work for the Washington Post or for the Baltimore Sun. Gotta hope it. Medicaid has been a life-saving program for me, allowing me access to critical health care services that my family would not otherwise have been able to afford. I am here today to ask you to help states preserve Medicaid coverage for the millions of people like me in this country who rely on it daily. I did not always rely on Medicaid. Until the age of 12, I had family health insurance coverage through my mother's employer, and thank goodness I did. My numerous chronic illnesses started in 1987 with the diagnosis at age two of common variable immunodeficiency, which is a mild form of the boy in the bubble syndrome, causing continuing serious viral infections. In, <clears throat> in 1995, at age 10, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I am now a proud 13-year cancer survivor. Because of my diagnoses, my family faced $50,000 in medical bills, which is 20% of medical bills totaling $250,000. And our family income, I became eligible for SSI, which automatically made me eligible for Medicaid. In 1997, two years after cancer treatment, I reached my lifetime maximum of $250,000 on my mother's health insurance. So I became reliant on Medicaid to cover the costs of chronic sinusitis, which required two surgeries, meningitis, three grand mal seizures, a life-threatening adrenocorticotrophic, or ACTH, endocrine deficiency, hypothyroid, anorexia, bipolar disorder, Asperger syndrome, colitis, growth hormone deficiency, hypertension, anemia, renal disease, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and fevers of up to 105 degrees. With this many chronic conditions, it was essential that I receive ongoing medical attention. Luckily, my Medicaid coverage in Maryland allowed me to receive the care I needed to cope with my health challenges. Unfortunately, individual insurance is not accessible to somebody like me who is disabled because of various health problems. These plans simply do not offer coverage to someone with health care issues as extensive and expensive as mine. And even if I am lucky enough to reach my dream and work for a big newspaper, employer-sponsored coverage will probably not be enough. Just as I reached my lifetime limit on my mother's employer-based coverage, I would likely quickly reach the limit on any coverage I receive through a future employer or be denied coverage due to pre-existing conditions. 
Luckily, my Medicaid coverage in Maryland allowed me to receive the care I needed to cope with my health challenges. Medicaid is an irreplaceable lifeline for me. Given all of my diagnoses and the treatment that I needed, I don't know what I would have done without Medicaid. During my cancer chemotherapy in 1995, while still on my mother's employee insurance, I was discharged from the hospital after a one-week stay. I returned just five hours later with a fever of 104. The insurance company had refused to pay for any more days for that hospitalization. Medicaid never discharged me before my medical team felt it was appropriate. Instead, I was able to get the medically necessary care I needed. Medicaid will be covering my treatment for occupational and physical therapy. As a child, I never had the opportunity to just go out and play and build up my muscles like the other kids in the neighborhood did. The muscles in my hands are so weak that I cannot type as much as I should for school in the future for work or in the future for work. I started college this fall and hope these therapies will increase my stamina and help me sustain the rigors of college and pursue a future career. In many states, I would be in danger of losing access to these important services, and that would put me at a severe disadvantage both in terms of my education and my future career prospects. As Congress considers how to protect Medicaid in these tough economic times, I hope you will think of the millions of people like me who rely on Medicaid and could see their lives significantly harmed if we are unable to receive the care we need through this important program. Now is the time for Congress to increase federal support for Medicaid to prevent states from making any further cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pinard. Good morning, Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member Burgess in the committee. I am Ray Pinard, President and CEO of 48HourPrint.com, an 85-employee small business specializing in online commercial printing. We are headquartered in Boston and have state-of-the-art print shop facilities located in Cleveland and Phoenix. Because we are a multi-state operation, I'm not taking a position today on endorsing any one particular football team. <laughs> I am also here on behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and serve as a member of its Board of Directors, Council on Small Business and Corporate Leadership Advisory Council. I believe the best way to treat an ailing economy and to protect health care coverage is for Congress to incentivize private sector job creation by providing tax cuts for businesses and making common sense changes to the health care system that will help contain costs and promote small business pooling so more of those jobs will include health care as a benefit. At 48hourprint.com, we responded to the tax incentives provided by the first stimulus package by jump-starting spending on capital equipment. We purchased a 40-inch offset printing press at a cost of two and a quarter million dollars. The bonus depreciation provision for the stimulus package resulted in $300,000 of bonus depreciation in 2008, which we are able to plow back into further capital equipment and providing jobs. This purchase could have been uh, delayed to a future date, but the investment incentives provided by the stimulus package made this purchase possible in 2008. Taxes do matter. Low taxes and incentives like these have helped me grow my business and provide 85 well-paying jobs with health, with health care benefits in the five short years that we have been operating. And I, I think also when we look at health care benefits, we should look at benefit packages as a whole. We also provide health care insurance, we provide dental insurance, we provide life insurance, we provide short-term and long-term disability insurance, and we, are, we also provide a $10,000 a year educational stipend for any employee who wants to go to college. For companies our size, I think this is a tremendous benefit package. 48hourprint.com story of utilizing the tax incentives provided by the first economic stimulus bill is just one example that represents thousands of similar actions taken by small businesses throughout the U.S. to invest in their companies. My decision and the decisions of many other business owners to make capital investments in our companies are directly the result of the tax incentives in the first stimulus package. 
as Congress moves forward in its consideration of a possible new stimulus plan, I would strongly encourage you to be mindful of this reality. I understand that Congress is facing very difficult decisions on what items to include in the second stimulus package. I am here to tell you today that the best way to protect health care benefits and to reduce health care costs incurred by states is to provide incentives for the private sector to create jobs. Creating private sector jobs is a win-win scenario for everyone, the employee, the employer, and the government. As an employer, I feel that you will get more bang for the buck by considering a second round of tax incentives crafted for small businesses to invest and expand. This would further encourage employers to do what they do best, grow our businesses, and create jobs. And as you know, most of the job creation in America is done by small and mid-sized businesses, with 80 percent of net new jobs being created by businesses with less than 500 employees. In my written testimony, you will find a list of suggested tax incentives. One of the most basic elements to fostering economic prosperity is creating a private sector job. And there is nothing more rewarding for an employer than to be able to afford to accompany that job with private sector health care benefits. If Congress could couple the tax incentives I have suggested with some common sense health care reforms, not only would states have more money flowing into their coffers through increases in payroll rosters and the resulting revenues, but by making it easier for employers to provide health care benefits, they will also experience less need for Medicaid funding by reducing the roles of the uninsured. Small businesses need more options to choose from when purchasing health insurance, and a free enterprise system should ensure that affordable health care is available to everyone. A small business should not be penalized for its lack of size or diversity of workforce. Every small business owner I know wants to offer affordable, dependable health insurance to our employees, and we need the type of flexibility that will keep us competitive in our respective marketplaces. To ensure this, we call upon Congress to help. With regard to a comment made by Congressman Burgess in his opening remarks, for years, the Chamber and, the, and businesses like mine have pushed for legislation that would provide relief by letting small businesses pool together across state lines to provide cost-effective and accessible insurance through trade and professional associations. In our situation, because we operate in three states, and we offer three levels of medical coverage to our employees, we essentially offer nine different plans. It would be much easier if we could deal, in our case, with the printing industry and offer three different plans that span across all 50 states. By being part of a larger group, small businesses would have greater negotiating power and would also reduce costs by having uniform standards from state to state. The Congressional Budget Office has found that allowing this would cost nothing and, in fact, save money for the government while helping more Americans get insurance. Mr. Pennard, I just wanted you to point out you're a minute over, so if you could kind of wrap it up. <laughs> in conclusion, uh, being in the printing industry, I'm very proud to quote one of, uh, one of the world's most famous printers, founding father Benjamin Franklin. He once said, watch the pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. I cite this quote knowing full well that in discussing tax policies and possible stimulus ideas, you may be considering a package with a price tag in the billions, which is hardly pennies. But Franklin's message does resonate in the sense that if Congress acts wisely in how it handles the pennies through reasonable tax incentives and common sense market-based health care reforms, the ensuing investment and in economic growth, the tax dollars, generated by businesses across our nation will be exponential. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Viard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to appear before you today to discuss this important and pressing topic. The U.S. economy is in a severe downturn. Although we do not yet have an official declaration to that effect, there can be no doubt that the downturn is a full-fledged recession. The severity of the economic difficulties that we're facing has understandably prompted calls for a fiscal stimulus package. I will submit today, however, that the case for fiscal stimulus uh, package is still quite uncertain. 
and that if a fiscal stimulus package is adopted, that the inclusion of an increase in Medicaid matching rates is an ineffective way to stimulate aggregate demand. And I will also urge the subcommittee to continue to think about the need to promote long-run growth, even as we simultaneously address the short-run difficulties that we are facing. I would like to begin, Mr. Chairman, by clarifying the potential role of fiscal stimulus. Increases in aggregate demand by increasing the category of some public or private spending cannot permanently boost the level of output. In the long run, an increase in spending in one part of the economy creates jobs there, but it displaces spending elsewhere in the economy, reducing employment in that sector. In the long run, the level of output in the economy is determined by the number of workers who are available, the labor market institutions that allow them to work, the supply of natural resources and the supply of capital, and the availability of technology. We therefore need to be wary of arguments that in increase spending on any particular item, whether it be Medicaid or defense or alternative energy, will permanently increase jobs. Instead, arguments for a particular category of spending should always be based upon the output that that is expected to provide to the American people in the form of beneficial services. So it is perfectly reasonable to argue in favor of Medicaid spending on the grounds that it will provide health care to those who are in need, or to argue in favor of defense spending because it will make the nation more secure, or to argue in favor of alternative energy spending because it will give us a better, uh, more reliable source of energy. But the, that's quite a different matter from arguing for it in, on the notion that it will permanently create jobs. Of course, in the short run, increases in aggregate demand can increase uh, employment and output. But what the, it effectively does is to borrow that output from the future. When spending decreases in some other item, we do experience an output loss. Obviously, none of us would want to increase output at some random date and then later reduce it at some other random date. What we would like to do is, of course, to increase output in conditions like today's, when we clearly have a desperate need to, for more economic growth, even if we know that we need to pay it back at some future date. But to accomplish that goal, aggregate demand needs to be managed in a very careful manner. Now, economists of all persuasions, liberals and conservatives, have long argued that in most cases the best ways to manage aggregate demand are through monetary policy and through the automatic fiscal stabilizers that are built into our economy. Monetary policy, of course, has already responded aggressively to the current downturn, with interest rates having already been slashed by 425 basis points. The Federal Reserve does still have a little bit of room to move further on monetary policy, although to be sure, it will soon begin to encounter the zero lower bound on interest rates. Monetary policy does take some time to work, but the interest rate cuts began 14 months ago, and so we will still see their impact. Automatic fiscal stabilizers are also an important part of today's economy. In any recession, there are automatic reductions in tax receipts and automatic increases in government spending. And we have already seen that response in this downturn as we have in earlier ones. Now, there is always the possibility, Mr. Chairman, of supplementing these types of stabilization with some type of fiscal stimulus package. And that is one of the issues that you are considering today. But as the economists that I quote in my testimony, economists from the Brookings Institution, note that it is a fiscal stimulus package has to be designed carefully. And that, Mr. Chairman, I submit, probably does not include a temporary increase in Medicaid matching rates. An increase in Medicaid spending by the Federal Government does not directly increase aggregate demand. It is a transfer from the Federal Government to the State Governments. And as such, it does not directly increase aggregate demand any more than would a transfer of money from one of the Federal Government's bank accounts to another of its bank accounts. Of course, it will increase aggregate demand if state governments respond to that increase in federal aid in a manner that boosts uh, spending in the economy. It is a little unclear to me, Mr. Chairman, exactly what effects are envisioned from this increase in the FMAP percentage. If states increase their Medicaid spending or avert their uh, cuts that they otherwise would adopt, there may be some increase in aggregate demand, but it is hard to see a substantial one. Recipients might be able to consume somewhat more medical care, which as a result would be good in its own right, but it is hard to imagine it being a large stimulus to aggregate demand. An increase in provider payments will, of course, increase the incomes of those providers, uh, but it is hard to imagine that they would increase dramatically their consumption in response to a temporary increase in incomes. It also is important to look at how the money would be distributed. And across the board, increase in FMAPs rewards those states with the largest Medicaid programs. 
allowing states to use an outdated FMAP percentage in place of the new FMAP percentage uh, for a given fiscal year actually rewards those states that have had the fastest per capita income growth, which seems antithetical to targeting aid towards those states in need. Of course, any of these proposals would increase spending on a program that has grown unsustainably and that is projected to continue growing unsustainably. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't see an increase in Medicaid matching rates as being a useful part of a fiscal stimulus package. In closing, I would also urge the subcommittee to keep in mind the need that even as we address the short-term difficulties we face, to also keep a part of the focus on the need to promote long-run economic growth, particularly by, through tax and spending policies that will promote private business investment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Viard. Now um, we'll have questions, and I'll start with myself for five minutes. And I wanted to start with uh, Mr. Sperling. You know, this is very complex, and yet uh, because of the economic downturn and the dire situation, we obviously have to get it right. And I was very interested in your comments because I read an article within the last few days, I guess it was in the New York Times, I forget who it was by, that was um, talking about Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt, you know, dare we go back to those days, and saying that part of the problem, you know, everyone assumes that when Roosevelt came into office that automatically he started this big stimulus package and got the government going again. I mean, I should say got the economy going again. But in reality, it was very much the opposite. He was uh, reluctant to, uh, to uh, have a huge stimulus. He was worried about the debt. He actually increased taxes. And it wasn't that successful in the first few years. And it wasn't until uh, World War II came along and so much money was being spent that the economy actually started to turn around in a significant way. And the advocate, I forget who it was, one of your colleagues was essentially saying you need a huge stimulus. You know, we're, we're just not talking enough money here. And, you know, in, in September, I think we did a $60 billion package. We've talked about $150 billion. I think the FMAP part of that was only 14 or 15. You were using figures much larger, you know, 300, maybe, I thought you said 60 for, the, for FMAP. Maybe I got that wrong. But at the same time, the issue is, you know, it, particularly to this subcommittee is, you know, the FMAP part of it. So some of the part of it is how big should the stimulus be and then how effective is some of the, as Dr. Viard said, how effective is the FMAP part of this in terms of the total picture. So um, I guess I wanted to ask you those two questions again. I know you kind of got into it, but I mean, what do you say to those, you know, some of my colleagues, and I'm, I, I'm not, you know, trying to distract from them, you know, seem to be implying that, you know, well, what about the debt? You know, Marsha mentioned PAYGO. Um, you know, what about all that? I mean, are we just, do we just not worry about the debt? Do we not worry about PAYGO because this is such a dire circumstance that we just have to spend and spend? And then the second thing, maybe responding to Dr. Viard, how, how effective is the uh, FMAP part of it if it becomes robust in actually stimulating the economy? I think you, your mic, mic might not Sorry. be working there. Um, first of all, on the fiscal side, um, you know, obviously, you know, my position and I believe the policies we had in the eight years in the Clinton administration were very strong on the importance of long-term fiscal discipline. I think Keynes basically say that smart fiscal policy kind of leans against the wind. Um, in other words, you are expansive when demand is, is very weak. The government uh, is willing on a short-term basis, just on a short-term basis, a year or two years, to allow the deficit to go up to stimulate the economy. And part of the thought, too, is that if you allow uh, a deep recession to happen, the, the fall in revenues and the rise in automatic stabilizers, stabilizers would end up increasing the deficit anyways, but, but with a worse economy. Now, the other side of that is to lean against the wind the other way, that as the economy is doing stronger, you want to increase savings. And, and I think we're learning that one of the reasons why you like to have, want to have good long-term fiscal policy is so that when you do come to a time of war or a time where you need a stimulus, you're in a position that you can do that for a year or two uh, at less risk um, to the economy. Um, I, uh, again, I had never in my life before uh, advocated for a stimulus above 
um, you know, around 150 billion. I'm just extremely, extremely worried. I've never seen a situation like this uh, where I just worry there's just going to be such a broad cutback in spending. And if you look at the projections for 2009 and the rest of the global economy, I think this is a moment where you'd actually like world leaders in the way that you do a coordinated monetary policy to all say that they're going to do a significant fiscal stimulus. It absolutely is not a way to create, you know, permanent job creation. What you're trying to do is stop an incredibly painful downward cycle with a temporary injection uh, of demand. And I guess I would, um, uh, uh, and in that light, you do have to think more expansively. How could you get 300 billion or more into the economy? It sounds very large, but it's really just around 2 percent of GDP. If you're worried that you're going to be in negative growth for an entire year, it's that in and of itself is not uh, an excessive amount. Now, I think uh, having some smart small business tax cuts, extending the 179 expensing, uh, uh, those type of kind of use it or lose it tax incentives for businesses make sense. I think giving tax cuts to ordinary people uh, and hope they spend make sense. I do think that the evidence does not suggest that you get quite as high of a bang for the buck as those measures, but I have still supported them in the past and I still support them now. But I think in this context, I am worried that people are hurting so bad and the economy will be so weak, it might not inject inspire, incent the spending that you want. So I think there's a degree of which you have to kind of almost make sure there's going to be more spending. And I think you do have to be tough. You know, I think if you're looking at even things I support, like green jobs or infrastructure, you do have to ask, is the, the money going to come out in that 18-month window where you're trying to stimulate the economy? And if not, then you have to say it's a good measure, but you got to do it as long-term policy and figure out how you pay for it. But if you can do some things that are good for the future and stimulate the economy in the 18 months, you should have a hearing. I mean, one should give that a hearing and see if people can find things that would be good for uh, energy independence or good for infrastructure that could spend out fast enough. If they can't, they shouldn't be part of a stimulus. If they can, we should be open to it. But in this environment, you do want to do some of the things that are surefire uh, successes in getting demand out. And the truth is, is that things like unemployment I I insurance and food stamps and the FMAP are among, I believe economists think, among the most successful. I mean, Dr. Fiart said you want to have automatic stabilizers. But this is essentially an automatic stabilizer. I mean, your unemployment insurance goes up in a weak economy. Medicaid spending will go, should go up in a weak uh, um, uh, economy. So essentially when you're increasing FMAP, you're simply making up for the fact that we don't have Medicaid as an automatic stabilizer anyways. So by that very logic, you are, uh, you, you, we recognize that as unemployment goes up, you have both state pressure uh, on other things and you have more people coming on the rolls. It's a terrible choice for states. I worked for two and a half years for, uh, for, uh, for a governor uh, during the 1990 recession. It is a terrible choice. You have less revenue and more demand. And I think the cutbacks that you make in those situations are contractionary, they hurt the economy, and because they're in such things often as cutting back teachers, uh, police officers, they're bad and they're also, I think, very damaging for consumer confidence. So the FMAP is one of the quickest, most automatic things that you can do right away to get stimulus in the economy. And I, I have to object to one thing. It is not a transfer of, one, of the federal government. The federal government can borrow. States have balanced budget requirements. So states don't have the opportunity to provide this temporary stimulus. This is the reason why you look to the federal government in a case like this to do temporary borrowing so that you can deal with the pain and distress but do so in ways that, that money uh, will go out quickly. So in this context, I believe we need to think about a much larger uh, FMAP, both because of the distress I see and because I think it's one of the most effective stimulus. Mark Zandi, others who looked at what gets out the quickest and what has the highest multiplier effect, find aid to state relief, I believe, among the top three. So the, 
this isn't an all or nothing thing. We can have tax, smart tax incentives for people uh, like, you know, Mr. Pinard, and we can have some consumer tax cuts. But I think what's different this time around is we're just going to have to do more, do more to directly get money into the economy because it may be so weak that we may have trouble incenting people to get there alone. That's why I think things like FMAP uh, and state, state aid make a, a lot more sense this time around than in the past. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Burgess, I'm going to, I want to hear from uh, Governor Napolitano, so I'll give you the same amount of time uh, because this is important and I want to make sure we, we get everything out here. I wanted you to respond to the same thing, Governor, but in addition to that, if you will, um, one of the, um, one of the, you talked about being a governor in 2003 when we did have the FMAP uh, pass. Um, but it, it, my understanding is it took time to accomplish that. In other words, uh, while we were working to, to do that, many families lost their Medicaid coverage. Um, and one of the issues is would it be preferable to have an automatic trigger for increases based on economic indicators, in other words, rather than just do this piecemeal. But I also wanted to hear if you wanted to respond to the same thing that uh, Mr. Sperling was talking about. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me answer the second question first. Sure. I, I think having sort of an automatic trigger built into Medicaid makes a lot of sense. Uh, how that is constructed requires some care. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it is a, a, a device that does help stabilize and is somewhat countercyclical so that instead of having to have these kinds of hearings every down cycle, if there were some automatic triggers, uh, that, that would, I think, improve the Medicaid program. See, the other thing, too, and you comment on this as well, is that, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of people are saying the stimulus needs to be bigger is because they figure that as states cut back, um, whatever stimulus we do may be essentially eaten up by those state cuts. And so that's why it needs to be larger. But anyway, go ahead. I want to hear from you rather than commenting myself. Go ahead. Well, well, well thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and let me, I think, I, I think it's important to understand, as, 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 as Jean said, states cannot borrow. Uh, we must balance our budgets every year. We have three basic functions we pay for. We, we educate, we medicate, and we incarcerate. Uh, and the medication part is Medicaid. Um, Education is, the, is by far the largest part of state budgets and then incarceration costs. Um, when you have a shortage of revenue, as the states do now, you've got to take that from somewhere. So unless there's an increase in FMAP, you've got choices. You can either remove people from the Medicaid rolls and increase the number of uninsured, which has huge social costs uh, beyond the offload of costs under the health care uh, provider community. You can cut back on education, and you began the hearing with a statement about the importance of investment in, in knowledge, in biomedical research as a long-term economic stimulus. Well, the largest discretionary item in the Arizona budget below prisons, uh, if, you, if you call them discretionary, which I don't, uh, but it, are universities. So you have 40 states now looking at large cuts to university budgets unless they get some help on the FMAP side of things. Um, and beyond that, you're at a situation where uh, states have already, as I mentioned before, taken, taken, already taken drastic measures. You know, we have h hiring freezes. We have laid off people. We have uh, instituted moratoriums on school construction in a state that has the fastest growing zero to five population of any state in the country. We've deleted uh, optional state services like adult dental coverage for poor adults, poor seniors. Uh, all, those, all those things have been done. So you're really down to the basics. Uh, and now if you don't do the FMAP, what you're going to have to do is force states either to do these cuts, countercyclical, doesn't help our nation get out of a recession, or to raise taxes, also countercyclical, because I agree with several of the speakers here. I think some targeted tax cuts for small business make a lot of sense in a national economy such as we have today in order to stimulate. And it's all about stimulating demand and getting deals going again, getting business going again, getting job creation going again. Uh, so. In a sense, what you have is a, is a program before you that has worked before in the short term. What I am suggesting is do it again. Our calculus is, is it needs to be at least $25 billion for each of the next two years to really work. Um, and then to uh, absolutely look at, at uh, the Medicaid statute and structure itself so that the, we build in some economic triggers for future purposes. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Burgess. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, Dr. Viard, we heard Mr. Sperling just answer a question, and he talked about the uh, the FMAP increase being one of those automatic stabilizers, and, and your testimony seemed to be at odds with that. Do you have any further comment to make on, on that? Yes, uh, thank you. The, um, the FMAP increase, of course, that we're considering today is not an automatic in increase precisely because we're here holding hearings about it, which is one of the things that makes it um, uh, it makes it problematic, I think, in a couple respects, um, Mr. Congressman. Uh, one is, of course, that we can't be certain that we will get the timing right. And the other is that unlike the automatic stabilizers, which are automatically targeted to those parts of the country that are in the greatest distress, the FMAP increase that we're considering uh, today doesn't have uh, that characteristic. Um, I think that uh, some of the ideas that have been put forward in this hearing concerning uh, setting up some type of automatic adjustment does make sense. And I think there's a variety of things that could be explored. We could have a uh, system set up where FMAP does automatically rise during weak economic conditions and automatically fall during strong economic times. We could have options available to states that uh, in order to maintain their eligibility criteria during a downturn, which would of course be a uh, sound policy, that they could avail themselves of a temporarily higher FMAP if they accepted a temporarily lower FMAP when the economy uh, recovered. But I think the proposals that we're considering today uh, are really quite different. An increase in FMAP with no offsetting uh, reduction later um, and a lack of targeting uh, to those states that are in need. In the interest of full disclosure, I did vote for in favor of the FMAP increase in 2003. I think I'm the only person here who did. Um, did you vote for the FMAP increase in 2003? That was the jobs and growth, yeah, that $250 billion tax cut that you guys opposed so bad? I don't remember. Yeah, I think you voted against it. But I voted for it. I just want the record to show that. But, uh, Dr. Fiard, before we, we depart, this subject. Now on the next panel we're going to hear about NIH and, and funding of biomedical research as a form of economic stimulus. We don't get an economist on that panel, so I'm going to impose upon you to be the, uh, the adult in the room for the next panel and give us just a, a preview of uh, how the, uh, what, what your feeling is about the, uh, the increase in NIH funding being used as an economic stimulus as well. Thank you. I, of all the types of spending that one might want to consider uh, manipulating for purposes of uh, stabilizing the business cycle, it really seems to me that biomedical research would be at the absolute uh, bottom of the list. Now, let's be clear from the outset that it's a completely separate question of what value biomedical research may have because, of course, biomedical research can have enormous benefits in terms of promoting the health and the well-being and the longevity of the American people. But as a tool to stabilize the business cycle, I think it's uh, completely ill-suited to uh, use it for that purpose would imply that the budget for research would be increased during every recession and would then be cut back during every expansion, which would be absolutely inimical to the notion of a long-run uh, research strategy. Um, I think that the comments that the Congressional Budget Office made uh, with respect to a slightly different category of spending would apply here. A CBO commented in a January report, some of the candidates for public works, such as grant-funded initiatives to develop alternative energy sources, are totally impractical for countercyclical policy, regardless of what other merits they may have. I think that comment absolutely applies to, to biomedical research. I think that biomedical research should be funded based upon the benefits that it can bring to the American people in terms of the research and the business cycle considerations should be completely divorced from that funding decision. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sperling, let, let me just ask you because, it, you know, we just had a presidential election, you may have heard, uh, and during the run-up to that election there were several debates and at least in the last debate, if I recall correctly, both candidates talked about the need for, re for, for reducing spending and the need to move. I think the question was posed uh, by Mr. Schieffer, are you going to pursue a balanced budget? And both indicated that they would. Mr. McCain, Senator McCain said he would do so by across the board cuts. Senator Obama, President-elect Obama said that it would be more t uh, surgical. And, but the only cut that he ever mentioned specifically was a cut to Medicare Advantage. Do you think we can cut Medicare Advantage enough to cover the expense of the increased FMAP, and are we going to have to rely on that for the, the cutting in, in Medicare Advantage to pay for other things, or is the concept of pay-go and cutting spending to offset any of this increased spending, is that just completely out the window at this point? 
Well, I think the idea of a stimulus is actually that you're not offsetting during that short window. Um, and I think that it is an unfortunate situation that we have such a that we have such a high deficit that the next administration will ha will inherit such a um, such a large deficit. And in that context, you would normally not want to have to do a stimulus. Um, so I think to you call for such a large stimulus like this, or I am not because you want to, but I feel that we have to. I do believe that a stimulus is not a get out of fiscal responsibility, you know, free card forever. So in other words, um, the idea of a stimulus should be that you're letting the deficit go up for that period of time in which you are trying to get more spending into the economy, um, but only for that period of time. Um, so I do think, I mean, I may disagree. Um, I mean, I have a, little, a slightly different attitude than Dr. Farrad in the following way, which is that I, but I think this is where I'm sure we both agree, which is that money has to go out during that period to be a stimulus. If you pay for it, then it's not actually stimulating the economy, it's neutral. But on the other hand, if you call for a stimulus for two years and the money doesn't spend out to year three, it, it, it's obviously failed. Um, to uh, um, meet its purposes. Now, I do think one thing you can do is let's say uh, let's say you had a an investment that you thought was um, uh, very wise over a five-year period. Um, now, somebody might come in and say, "Well, and I mean, this is to be honest, what what many of us criticize the for is they'd say, well, we're in a recession, we don't have to pay for all of it." And we'd say, well, no, you don't have to pay for it for the year or two that you're trying to stimulate the economy, but in the long term, you do. So, you know, for example, if somebody was doing a, if you were doing a 10-year extension of SCHIP, I might think it might make sense for the first two or two and a half years to not, to, uh, to waive the offsets for those two and a half years because you're trying to stimulate the economy at that point, but it wouldn't be an excuse to never pay for it or have offsetting savings. Um, so I think you really have to distinguish between the fact that you are allowing a short-term deficit, um, and therefore it does add to the debt, but it's just for that one year. But you shouldn't use it as an excuse, which is what I fear we did too much in the previous seven, eight years, of using it as a way to do long-term permanent increases. Now for me, what I would do on health care is I would uh, use the FMAP because I think even though it is not an automatic stabilizer, stabilizer right now, it kind of should be and it operates that way. So I think having an increase right now um, would help be helpful to stimulate the economy. It would mean temporary borrowing to help stimulate the economy. For the long term, what I would do is I would encourage a bipartisan work on a universal health care plan that would cover everybody, but would also at the same time take on much broader issues of the waste that happens from people trying to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions, uh, where there's negative incentives, the cost shifting, all of those things. Those are the broader things I think you have to do to bring down the growth of Medicare and Medicaid costs in the future. If you did that together in 2009, 2010, then you could say we're increasing health care costs temporarily to help us get out of an economy, the, the, out of this recession. But we're also working on a long-term package to cover every all Americans, make health care more efficient, uh, uh, and thereby bring down the cost of health care. If I could just interrupt you for a moment, I mean, even under the most optimistic of scenarios to take on that second piece, it's 160 to 480 billion dollars a year for, for, for the plan that was outlined by Senator Obama or President-elect Obama during, during the run-up to the campaign. So I mean, we're, we've increased the debt limit three times this year. We're barely a month into the fiscal year, and we've got a $1 trillion deficit on top of a $3.2 trillion budget. The Chinese won't loan us any more money. Where, where do you propose that we get this if we're not going to restrain spending in some other, in some other quarter? Well, I, I, what, what I would argue personally is that as you're trying to do a universal health care, you, you try to rationalize the health care system. Let me tell you just for, on an economic point of view. Well, you know. but I, I want to get back to Mr. Pinar before I run out of time, okay. so very quickly. Sure. But go, go ahead, but very quickly. Well, I, I mean, President-elect Obama has clearly talked about using offset from not extending the tax cut for people over $250,000 as a way of getting 
$100 billion or so savings, I believe, to... But in fairness, though, the Congressional Budget Office has already figured that in. The Bush tax cuts have expired as far as the Congressional Budget Office well, is in their, in their budget project th projections this, this is one for the next 10 years. This is one place where the President-elect and the current President agree on what the ba that, that the baseline calls for extending that. It's still a choice, and you're, you're doing that for savings. But, but my That point, still becomes new spending. But, but, but my, my, my point is, and, and I just encourage you to think about it this way, Right now, what hurts our country and competitiveness, the cost to competitiveness for businesses, for people, is the rising cost of health care generally. To, to not try to fix that, um, uh, uh, to, to allow our national health care spending to grow, to grow so great and just feel comforted that you're keeping the public ledger part of it lower. It's just no comfort. I mean, Governor Schwarzenegger is the one who says very eloquently that when you allow massive un uninsured, uninsured Americans, that they end up getting too late expensive coverage, which then ends up being a hidden tax on the premiums of all Americans. Now, you can feel comforted that that's not publicly on the ledger, but I think that if you can have an upfront cost in subsidies for Americans and health care information technology, but it's then part of a plan that does have some tough medicine that for slowing the growth of health care, that in the long term, for our long term Medicare entitlement growth, a, a, a universal health care plan that brought down the growth of national health care spending overall. But it won't. And, and we have a graph somewhere in this packet that shows the projection in the increase in Medicaid spending over time, which is, uh, that, I think the, the, the term this uses is unsustainable. I, I do want to get to Mr. Pinard before, because he was because we were so, uh, you were so kind to come to the panel, and I, I want to give you a chance to at, at, at least uh, discuss this for just a moment. Now, we've heard the argument for universal insurance, and in the interest of full disclosure, I was a surrogate for Senator McCain during the campaign. So, yeah, I know McCain's playing pretty well, but as a consequence of being in 15 cities in the last two months, I also know Senator President-elect Obama's playing pretty well as, also. Um, if we go to a system where there is now a new, like Medicaid, like Medicare, there's a new national health insurance patterned after the FEHBP that you either show, as a business, you either are going to show credible coverage or your employees are going to be covered under this new national plan. Um, what's the inclination there? You're, you're offering a pretty generous package of benefits right now, and I, I commend you for doing that. I had a small business, and I had about the same number of employees as you, so I, I fully know how expensive it is to provide those benefits. So if you look around you and you see your competitors are saying, yeah, you know, credible coverage, I, I can't keep up with it. I'll just pay the fine and get into the national plan. Do you think that that's likely to be, I mean, it's hard to project human behavior, but do you think that that's likely to be a, a sentiment uh, shared by some of your competitors and make that not also put pressure on you to, to look at that as well? My fear, uh, my fear in, in a, uh, a universal plan of that nature, if it was a, a single system and everybody had to participate, uh, sooner or later we're going to end up trying to satisfy everybody. And you know you may satisfy one percent with this coverage, but ninety, a hundred percent have to pay into it because you have to assume that the larger percentage is going to participate. Um, so I don't think that the costs, plus the administrative cost involved in administering a national universal health care system, I would imagine would have to be astronomical. So I think the system would be very burdensome and not attractive to private employers. I feel that uh, with private employers that I deal with, they would prefer to preserve the uh, free market health care system that currently exists as, is, as it exists today or even in a more free market with the AHPs um, to allow them to choose the coverages they want that best fits their employee profile. Uh, as you know, uh, young technology companies have a certainly uh, a very dim different demographic than a machine shop that's been in business for 60 years. Uh, and they require different kinds of coverage and, and, and uh, different uh, uh, emphasis. Uh, so I, the private sector, as far as I know, with the people that I deal with, would prefer, to, prefer to see that there is a private sector health care system that is maintained that they can 
choose from and choose who their carrier is going to be and so on. What, 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 from a competitive standpoint, what does it do? What does it do to your printing business if you look around and every other printer in the cities in which you work have said, "Oh, to heck with it! I'll just uh, pay the fine and be on the or the tax, wherever we call it, and I'm, I'll be in the national plan." And yet, you are obviously by nature very generous, and you're providing your employees with the the Elysian fields of benefits that you that you now spread before them. Are are you going to have to rethink that? Well, it, this, that would make us very uncompetitive because if, uh, for instance, I believe in Massachusetts the fine is $250. $250 doesn't go anywhere towards providing somebody with sure. health care for the year. So it takes a lot of $250 checks to uh, fund that system. And as you know, Governor Patrick is having uh, uh, a devil of a time up there trying to deal with this. Um, but it makes us uncompetitive if we elect to provide a more fuller, generous uh, health insurance plan so that it, it's an employee benefit and it's a job attraction tool. It w we, we would try to maintain our benefit plan uh, so that we can attract better employees. Very good. And just one, one comment to our, our friend from, from, from Maryland. I went to medical school in Houston. I uh, didn't know David, but I knew of David, and our medical school class was was allowed to see him one day, so uh, certainly appreciate the difficulties that uh, with which you've existed and uh, obviously done very well. I, I do, uh, as a father who paid for a journalism degree from my middle daughter, I do wonder about your selection of a profession. The Washington Post, I, I fully expect you to complete your studies, having heard from you today. I'm not sure the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun will still be there when you emerge on the other end. And I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Such optimism. <laughs> you sound like me. <laughs> Listen, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, all of you for being here today. I know they've just had the questions from the two of us, but I think it was very worthwhile, and I appreciate your input uh, as we move forward on this. And as you know, we're probably going to uh, deal with the legislation next week, so it's very timely that you were here today. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, as we go to our next panel, can I ask unanimous consent that uh, the report Why Government Spending Does Not Stimulate Economic Growth from the Heritage Foundation be submitted into the record? The report dated November 12th and points out that every dollar the government injects into the economy is first taxed or borrowed out of the economy. In fact, uh, it doesn't create new purchasing power. It simply redistributes existing purchasing power. And I'll submit this for the record. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, I'll ask the second panel to be seated. Before we uh, go to the second panel, I have a unanimous consent request also. These are the remarks uh, by Mr. Towns, um, who had to leave, and also um, three items. Um, the testimony by uh, the Governor of New York, Mr. Patterson, before the House Ways and Means Committee on October 29th which discusses New York's dire need for at least a 5 percent increase in the FMAP through 2011. Second, a November 12, 2008 New York Times article entitled, Brooklyn Lab is part of City's goal to be a biotech center, which discusses a new HIV AIDS lab in the Brooklyn Army terminal section of the city and how it is the precursor to the city's initiative to make New York City a biotech hub. And third, a letter to uh, uh, to the Speaker, to Nancy Pelosi, from more than 230 patient groups, scientific and medical societies, and research institutions urging support of increased NIH funding in the economic recovery uh, package. Without objection, uh, so ordered. And Mr. Chairman, I would also like to ask unanimous consent to the statement of the California Healthcare Institute, uh, which is submitted to the House of Representatives Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health, for our hearing today. And without objection, so ordered. Um, would the second panel uh, be seated? Okay, welcome. Thank you for being here on this important issue today. And let me introduce each of you, starting 
From my left is Dr. Raynard Kington, who is um, Acting Director of the National Institutes of Health. And then we have Mr. Ron Pollack, who is Executive Director of Families USA, and Ms. Rachel King, who is Chief Executive Officer of Glycomimetics, Inc. I hope I got that right, from Gagesburg, Maryland. And lastly is Dr. Joachim Kohn, Kohn, who is Director of the New Jersey Center for Biomaterials, and he's a professor at Rutgers University in my district in Piscataway. Thank you all for being here. I think you know the drill. We have five-minute opening remarks. They become part of the record, and each of you may, in the discretion of the committee, submit additional statements and writing for inclusion in the record. And we'll start with Dr. Kington. Good morning, Chairman Pallone and Dr. Burgess. I'm Raynard Kington. I'm the Acting Director of the National Institutes of Health, and it's a pleasure to be here to testify before you today on the potential role of NIH in stimulating the economy during the current financial crisis of the country. Uh, the economic downturn, as we all know, is complex in its origins, and its recovery process will be multifaceted. And stimulation of the economy is critical to this process. We believe that biomedical research can play a significant factor in stimulating the economy, while more importantly advancing the discoveries to improve the health of the public. NIH has a unique ability to provide an influx of funds to an established network of research institutions across the country, and this can be accomplished literally within weeks. With a long history of success in scientific discovery, the best peer review system in the world, and the trust of Congress and the American people, our impact on public health is well known and is exemplified by substantial reductions in mortality from such diseases as heart disease, many infectious diseases, cancer. It is fueled by new advances, such as the sequencing of the human genome, and we are poised to enter an era of personalized medicine that will allow us to accurately predict and then preempt the development of disease. Although our mission is and must remain first and foremost dedicated to seeking scientific knowledge to improve the health of all, our mechanisms for supporting research are ideally suited to stimulating the economy. NIH is a granting and contracting agency providing awards to research institutions that are an integral component of local economies, many of whom are the largest employers in their communities. These awards support local economies by creating jobs, building infrastructure, and conducting research that leads to new technologies and therapies. In turn, discovery leads to patents and new businesses producing additional economic benefits, and you will hear more about this from other witnesses. In fiscal year 2007, NIH funded 47,000 grants worth approximately $20 billion across the country. As you know, recent analyses indicate that NIH grants have a multiplier effect on the economy of up to two and a half times their value, and you'll hear more about this later. In addition, there is a leveraging effect of 35 percent from the NIH budget in terms of additional private sector investments in medical research stimulated by NIH funding. NIH grants support jobs. We estimate NIH funding supports more than 300,000 jobs in the United States, approximately seven positions for each grant. In addition, through its training programs for PhD, postdoctoral, and clinical uh, scientists, NIH supplies a major proportion of the human capital required for U.S. biomedical enterprises to remain globally competitive. To determine the long-term effect of NIH-supported research, we recently reviewed the outcome of approximately 30,000 grants awarded in fiscal year 2000. These grants resulted in over 30,000 invention disclosures, 17,000 non-provisional uh, patent applications, and more than 7,000 full patents. At least 17 percent of all drugs approved by the FDA between 1982 and 2006 cited NIH funding as a factor, and we believe that's an underestimate of the importance of NIH funding, especially basic science funding and the development of new drugs. NIH-supported research and training is key for U.S. global competitiveness in the biomedical industry. In today's global environment, large pharmaceutical and biotech companies can choose to locate anywhere in the world. NIH supported world-class laboratories filled with the best scientists in the U.S. based at our universities and other research institutions offer the biomedical industry a tremendous resource in the form of valuable collaborators as well as a pool of the leading scientists to draw upon, a critical incentive to do these businesses in the United States. Failure to sustain the biomedical research enterprise in this country will have never negative implications for science, medicine, and public health, as well as producing financial stresses on the research institutions that have already leveraged NIH funding with billions of dollars of their own to expand the research capabilities of a nation. With a flat NIH budget over the past five years, we have failed to sustain the NIH investment in the U.S. economy. 
the inability to sustain current levels of funding of scientific opportunity is quantifiable by the percentage of successful grant applications submitted to NIH. The historic norm for success rates has been about 30 percent. Five years of budgets that did not keep pace with medical research inflation have contributed to reductions in the success rate to about 20 percent, and if this trend continues, the success rate will continue to drop. During fiscal year 08, NIH identified 14,000 scientifically meritorious research applications that could not be funded. These grants have already undergone peer review process and have been approved by our public advisory councils. With additional funding, we would focus on these product, projects and others to fund important new science that otherwise would not be supported. A distribution of funds to many of the projects across the country could occur literally in a matter of weeks. The awards could be made with virtually no increase in NIH's administrative costs through existing processes and mechanisms. Among the underfunded areas of research are clinical trials involving genomics research in multiple disease areas, translational research in heart disease and stroke, AIDS vaccine research, asthma research, health disparities research, research on mental illness and addiction and kidney diseases, advances in imaging and other areas of research. These critical areas of research, among others, could be immediately funded and expanded for the benefit of the economy as well as for the benefit of the long-term health of this country. NIH proposes two issues for Congress to consider as it struggles with the current economic crisis. One is the potential effectiveness of biomedical research in directly stimulating the economy. The other is the consequence of failure to sustain the research enterprise in the United States at a time when so many important scientific opportunities have been identified. Investment in NIH is an investment in the U.S. economy and, more importantly, an investment in the future health of our nation. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Mr. Pollack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Burgess, I also want to thank you when you spoke to Mr. Viard in a, a previous panel and said he'd be the grown up uh, speak before this one. I want to thank you for recognizing my youth. I appreciate it. Uh, my testimony this morning uh, will focus on how additional funding uh, for NIH, America's leading medical research agency and the foremost biomedical research institute in the world can help the American economy. I do want to say one quick word, however, about the discussion you had in the prior panel. I think that uh, an FMAP increase is critically important. Uh, if you look at the last Census Bureau report, it shows that there was a significant continuing drop over the last few years in terms of employer-sponsored insurance. And the fact that we actually had a reduction in the number of people uninsured was attributable to increases in enrollment in Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program. Uh, there are at least 18 states that are in the process uh, of significantly cutting back the Medicaid program. And if we don't provide an FMAP increase, we are going to be digging a much bigger hole because as fewer people uh, have coverage in the employer sector, uh, we are not going to have a public safety net to pick them up, and the states do not have the ability to do so. Uh, at the last pages of testimony, we cited some of the states in terms of what they are doing to cut back. It would make the economy a whole lot worse. Um, others on this panel are going to speak to the enormous import importance that NIH plays with respect to uh, medical breakthroughs, as Dr. Kington just did. Uh, I want to testify about the positive economic force that NIH plays with respect to local economies, including job creation. Between 80 to 90 percent of NIH's approximate $29 billion budget funds extramural research that takes place in universities, medical research centers, hospitals, and other research institutes. Uh, we tried to gauge what the economic impact is, and we used as a tool for that the so-called RIMS-2 model uh, that is created by the Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, our report, um, which I hope can be entered into the, into the record in your own backyard, uh, describes this in greater detail. But I want to provide you with the most salient findings. Uh, in 2007, NIH awarded uh, almost $23 billion in grants and contracts to universities and research institutions in the 50 states. 
This funding generated a total of $50.5 billion in new business activity in the form of increased output of goods and services. NIH funding created and supported more than 350,000 jobs. And I want to emphasize that the average wage associated with those jobs was approximately $52,000. These are not uh, uh, jobs that uh, uh, provide really low wages. There's, it's about a, a 25 percent higher than the average U.S. wage. Let me just uh, uh, exemplify that by what, what happened in New Jersey. In New Jersey, uh, NIH provided grants and contracts of $280 million in 2007. This generated $631 million in new business activity. It led to the creation of 3,000, over 3,700 jobs. The average wage in New Jersey that was supported by these new jobs was $57,720. And this occurred as a result of major awards to institutions like the University of Medicine and Dentistry uh, of New Jersey and Rutgers University. Uh, in my written testimony, we described uh, uh, what those uh, grants and, and contracts supported. In 14 states, NIH funding generated over $1 billion in new business activity. Those states are California, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, uh, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, uh, and Washington. In 10 states, each dollar of NIH funding generated at least $2.26 in economic activity, including in the state of New Jersey. In six states, more than 20,000 new jobs were created. Uh, including uh, in Texas. In seven states, the average wage per new job exceeded $55,000, including, as I mentioned before, uh, New Jersey. This is all very important because, uh, as you heard in the testimony, uh, NIH performs an enormously important service, but it has done so with less than a flat budget. Uh, if you look at uh, the budget compared to uh, cost of living, in real dollar terms, the budget has declined. So it is important that we increase funding for NIH, both for the key medical research purposes it serves and for the benefit of the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. King. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Pallone, Dr. Burgess, I am delighted to be here today. I'm the CEO of Glycomimetics, which is a biotechnology company, and our lead product is in clinical trials today for the treatment of sickle cell disease. I'm here today representing the biotechnology industry organization, where I serve as a member of the board of directors as well as chair of the emerging companies section. And I'm really happy to be here today to discuss policies that Congress can implement both to spur the economy and to ensure the continuation of biomedical research. Federal funding of the Institutes of Health is clearly one of the most, uh, the National Institutes of Health is one of the most important things that we believe that can be done both to, uh, to stimulate the economy and to provide that critical research support. And BIO fully supports any and all efforts to do this. An increase in NIH funding, though, is just one of the things that Congress can do to invigorate the economy and to spur biomedical innovation. While some of these additional proposals may not fall directly within the jurisdiction of the committee of energy and commerce, it's our hope that Congress will consider them as part of any stimulus package as they would have a meaningful impact on the ability of biomedical innovation to continue during these tough economic times. The biotechnology industry holds tremendous promise for the future of health care. The industry has already delivered over 250 FDA approved therapies, many of which address important areas of unmet medical need or are first in class treatments. Biomedical research and innovation and the development of new treatments and therapies are key economic drivers. Life science R&D, as has been mentioned, provides high-tech, high-wage high jobs at both public research institutions and at the bio companies, biotech companies that typically locate close to these centers of academic research. However, in this economic crisis, many biotechnology companies are now struggling for survival. In October alone, over 20 companies publicly announced layoffs. 
Many other companies are making programmatic adjustments, such as shelving important research to conserve financial resources and to reduce cash burn rates. These companies are struggling because the financial markets are effectively closed to public biotechnology companies. Public market investors have been unwilling to participate in initial public offerings, and without strong governmental policies, the outlook for these companies remains dire. Increasing federal funding for biomedical research is a critical first step to alleviate the financial uncertainty that the industry is facing. An increase in NIH-supported research will yield more basic scientific findings and can also advance clinical and translational knowledge associated with the diagnosis and treatment of disease. NIH-supported research can potentially advance the early stages of development of new biotechnology products and thereby reduce the R&D burden on industry. The NIH also plays a critical role in the transfer of technology through which the fruits of NIH intramural research are transferred to industry, ultimately where they can be developed into preventative, diagnostic, and therapeutic products that will advance our ability to improve public health. Since completion of the doubling of the NIH budget over the five-year period from 1998 to 2003, annual appropriations for the agency have fallen below the rate of biomedical research inflation. Congress has been able to provide incremental funding increases. However, we fall well short of the costs associated with biomedical research and technology development inflation. To maintain research grants at current funding levels, annual increases of at least 3.5 to 5 percent are required. The funding of the last five years has effectively resulted in a 17 percent decrease in spending power on research for the NIH. And this is a serious challenge to the biotechnology industry. Bio strongly supports an additional $1.9 billion in funding for the NIH. This increase in funding will put us on the track of sustainable growth that's necessary to realize the full potential that we, that we see. While I acknowledge that this committee does not have jurisdiction over tax policy, I want to take this opportunity to highlight some potential proposals that would infuse, infuse much needed capital into the industry at this critical juncture. For example, corporate tax proposals allowing loss-making companies to immediately utilize their accumulated tax assets, such as net operating losses and research development tax credits, would infuse much needed capital into emerging biotech companies. Additionally, the enactment of certain investor tax proposals as short-term stimuli for investments, such as reductions in the capital gains rate, capital gains rollover, or reduced capital gains specifically for funds invested in our industry, would also serve to encourage investment. While the current crisis has substantially impacted the industry, I do remain optimistic that the biotech industry will triumph by working closely with the Congress, the administration, and by important institutions like the NIH. We will be able to continue to support biomedical innovation by increasing these government investments as well as enacting financial policies that will incentivize investment in the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Cohen, I understand your first name is pronounced Yoakum. I got it wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Burgess, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Joachim Kohn, and I am pleased uh, to address this committee about the economic value to the nation of investment in the NIH. As a Rutgers professor, I hold the title of Board of Governors Professor of Chemistry. I'm also the director of the New Jersey Center for Biomaterial and an adjunct associate professor of orthopedics. I am testifying here today because of my dual experience as an NIH-funded academic researcher as well as an entrepreneur who has started three companies and whose inventions have become FDA-approved uh, medical products. I would like to make two key points. First, NIH funding has obviously an immediate short-term stimulating effect on the economy. This, uh, this short-term effect has been well described in the report by uh, Families USA. I, uh, I would like to confirm that I agree with the findings of this report. My second key point is that NIH funding has a pronounced long-term effect on the economy and the well-being of our nation. I describe this longer-term uh, benefit as economic leverage. Simply stated, the investments uh, made by NIH-funded researchers are the basis of a substantial amount of economic activity relating to the translation of these inventions to medically useful products. In my personal experience, the, economy, the economic leverage has been tremendous. As little as 4.5 million in NIH support for my research activities at Rutgers resulted in technology commercialization efforts in four startup companies, briefly Tyrex Pharma, Riva Medical, 
Lux Biosciences and Renova Biomaterials have licensed my NIH-derived uh, inventions, have since then raised a total of 132 million in private equity, and have now created over 100 high-paying, uh, high-salary jobs, all paid for by private funding without further NIH support. Let me emphasize again that without NIH funding, none of these companies would be in existence today. The, in the NIH investment of 4.5 million made throughout the 1990s continues to bring benefits to our economy today. Tyrex Pharma has obtained FDA clear market clearance for two products and continues its research and marketing operation in New Jersey. Viva Medical is testing a revolutionary coronary stent in the clinical trials in Germany and Brazil with the expectation to start extensive clinical trials in the USA uh, sometime in 2009, in the middle of our economic crisis. Lux Biosciences is completing phase three clinical trials of, of voctosporin for the treatment of major and common diseases of the eye, such as dry eye syndrome, uveitis, and age-related macular degeneration. And Renova has just now been incorporated and has already attracted 1.2 million in its first round of financing. Renova has now started oper to operate in Somerset, New Jersey. This level of economic activity has been made possible by private follow-up investments, which have so far leveraged the original government funding at a staggering ratio of 29 to 1. Finally, in terms of the total benefit to society, I can see one additional economic incentive for the government's investment, which I refer as the indirect health dividend. By this, I mean the value of the improvement in the health of the nation, as uh, well as the reduction in healthcare cost derived from new products developed with NIH funding. I can illustrate the health dividend best with a personal experience again. Macular degeneration threatens my aging mother with blindness. Twice a year, a nurse has to come by uh, my mother's house to administer her prescription eye, dro eye drops. My mother, at age 84, is simply too frail to administer these drops herself. In response to this need, shared by millions of disabled and elderly Americans, I'm collaborating with Lux Biosciences to develop a new fully resorbable drug delivery system that can be inserted into the eye and that will deliver a variety of ophthalmic drugs for six to 12 months continuously, eliminating the need for daily nurse visits. The polymers we are using to develop this drug delivery system were invented as part of an NIH-funded research project in my lab. An additional example of the indirect health dividend is provided by the antimicrobial sleeve developed by a Tyrex Pharma to protect patients with uh, cardiac implants, such as pacemakers, from infection. This product alone has the potential to reduce the national health care cost by 240 million each year, as outlined in my written testimony. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman, the NIH stimulates our economy in many ways. In the short term, we can quantify these economic benefits in terms of the direct stimulatory effect as well as the significant multiplier or ripple effect that is felt throughout the nation. In addition, to the, in, addition in the long term, I believe that the grants and contracts provided by the NIH have a disproportionately large and lasting impact on our economy, uh, on our economy through the significant leverage of NIH funding by private capital and through the health uh, dividend. I am firmly convinced that increasing the NIH budget, whether in a near-term stimulus package or as part of future funding bills, will pay off both now and in the long run. I encourage you to take this comprehensive view, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I think Dr. Burgess is coming back, but I'm going to start with the questions here. And I'll start with uh, Ron Pollack. Um, you know, the reason we had this panel today is because um, of obviously a feeling on some of our part on the committee that, um, that uh, NIH funding uh, could be a significant stimulant for the economy. Um, it's not always thought of that way, I mean, in the way that FMAP is, though. And so I do want to kind of get into a little more exactly how it would be a significant stimulant. The, um, you know, there's also the fact that uh, in Congress many of us feel that uh, innovation uh, in itself is a good thing and that somehow innovation, which, you know, we've been lacking in some respects, 
uh, should be part of the stimulus. So if you would just, uh, Ron, if you could just to say specifically about on NIH, um, how is this such an ideal mechanism? In other words, how is it that, you know, the innovation, the research and that, you know, why should it be included um, as opposed to some other things? Well, the, uh, an investment in NIH, uh, which obviously has uh, critically important health consequences, uh, does uh, help the economy in significant ways. Remember that the overwhelming majority of resources that uh, NIH uh, receives from the Congress are spent uh, via uh, uh, institutions like universities and, and, and uh, research centers, uh, and they hire people uh, right away. They also, in the process, it leverages funds. It uh, funds from the federal government uh, uh, attracts other money, uh, both uh, at the state level and uh, in the private sector. Uh, and so, as a result, there is an immediate impact in terms of people being hired. When, when you get a grant or contract, you've got to deliver within uh, time parameters. And, and so, uh, uh, each of these institutions uh, quickly staff up to make sure that they can fulfill the contract. And that has an immediate economic consequence. All right. Thank you. Now, I wanted to ask Dr. King, Dr. Kington, um, sort of the negative and the positive. The negative being, uh, you know, because, um, you know, in the past five years, NIH has not received any increase in funding in real terms. Um, you know, uh, well, actually, it hasn't received any increase. If you take the inflation factor, we've actually cut NIH budget for the past five years. So do you think you could estimate what our country has lost in economic benefit due to the past six years of flat funding? Can you explain? what the impact of this level of funding has been on the NIH's ability to spur medical innovation. And finally, uh, your thoughts on what impact this has had on our ability to attract talented and promising young minds. Those are my negatives, then I'll get into the positives. Well, well, clearly we believe that we are at an extraordinary point in biomedical and behavioral science where there are tremendous opportunities. And because of the flattening budget, we aren't able to invest in those opportunities to the degree that we think would be optimal for the American people. Um, I think that uh, the success rates, uh, drop in the success rates of, of funding applications is one indicator. Um, part of that reflects uh, a, an appropriate reading in the academic community and the university and research community that the country was investing in the enterprise of biomedical research, and that led to a priming of the pump. Uh, more people were being trained. There were investments, substantial investments by institutions at local levels to strengthen their infrastructure. And just as they were able to do that, they were met by flat budgets with drop in success rates. One of the greatest concerns of, my, of Dr. Zahuni, who's uh, tenure just ended, was the, the potentially horrible effect this might have on young investigators, on new investigators. And we believe that that is a concern and that more and more uh, young and new scientists are thinking long and hard before making an investment in a scientific career because the outlook doesn't, isn't so positive when their success rates are 20 percent. Now, we're doing everything we can to target funds within the agency uh, so that we can investigate, in, invest in new investigators, um, but we have limited options in the face of a flat budget. Well, let me do the positive then. Let's say we were to take the number used by FAMS USA and increase funding for NIH by 6.6 percent or, or 1.4 billion. What would that mean in terms of new grants being funded? And um, would you be able to fund grants immediately or, or will it take time? We've looked into this. Um, we believe that we could um, fund several thousand grants within a matter of weeks. Um, for every about 500 million or so, we could fund an additional 1,400 grants that would not have otherwise been funded. Um, we believe that we can do it without increases in infrastructure. We are primed and ready to go. These are, we have 10,000 grants that have already been approved from the last fiscal year that have been found to be scientifically meritorious and that have been approved for funding by our public advisory councils. So it's just a matter of getting these grants out the door. We have established relationships with 3,000 institutions across the country who are ready and primed to receive these funds. We are confident that we could make the investment within a period of four to six weeks. Okay, great. And I want to just emphasize uh, with, the, with the figure you, uh, you use, this would, uh, by uh, the calculation that 
uh, using the RIMS model uh, would increase over 9,000 jobs uh, over the course of the year. Okay. Is he, uh, you were, you were I'm waiting for Dr. Burgess. Let me, and I'm over my time, but let me, let's see if he's coming. He is. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to mark That's all right. I yield to the gentleman. Let me uh, uh, first just say that this, this hearing is not about the value of the NIH because there is no one up here who disputes the value of the NIH. You're the crown jewel in the federal government. You are the agency, the system that works when all else fails. So uh, I want to say that up front, Dr. Zerhuni was very good to me during his tenure. I took many field trips out to the NIH. Look forward, Dr. Kington, to getting out and, and visiting with you. Um, but one of the things Dr. Zerhuni talked about when we went through a when I came on the committee two terms ago, it had been years since there had actually been an authorization bill for the NIH. And one of the things Dr. Zerhuni was very concerned about, that it was feast or famine, one year to the next. He never knew what was going to happen. He asked us for stability. He asked us for flexibility with the translational research, to be sure. But he asked us for some, some degree of stability in knowing what he could depend on from year to year because my understanding is many of these grants aren't just a few months' time. They're, they're like 60 months or five years. So if we give you something one year and don't continue it the next year, then we've, we've brought a young scientist in, we've staffed up a lab, and now we're not, uh, we're not continuing it. That's very disruptive, obviously, to the, to the ongoing research. We went through a, an extensive uh, reauthorization process, which could, concluded two years ago, December of 06, right before the end of the 109th Congress. And in that reauthorization bill, and we took a lot of criticism for this, uh, the baseline budget, I believe, was $29.5 billion, and it was to be a 5% authorization increase for the next five years was what was laid out. And Dr. Zuhuni felt very comfortable with that as a, as a roadmap for going forward. I think, Ms. King, that would fit within your parameters of a 3.5 to 5 percent increase. Now, we were criticized because although the rate of biomedical inflation was 3.5 percent at the time, medical inflation was 7 percent. And there were people on this committee who argued that our, our number should be somewhere in between 3.5 and 7. But 5 is where we ended up. And then, we weren't in charge of the appropriations. And so the next year, when uh, um, Chairman Pallone's guys on the Appropriations Committee came up with, what, a 2 percent increase, and then we didn't do any appropriations at all last year. We did a continuing resolution. We'll get to you in February if that's okay. So there is your problem, is the fact that we made a promise to you as authorizers on this committee, and the appropriators have not executed that responsibility correctly. And it seems to me that we will be going down the same path that Dr. Zerhuni found bothersome a couple of years ago where we inject, uh, I will agree that we're 6.6 percent behind what we should have been. If we gave you 2 or 3 percent in the fiscal year before and nothing this fiscal year, should you should be up 10 percent. So yeah, that 6.6 percent figure makes sense, but the reality is that should have been a stable, dependable appropriation coming from a stable authorization that was laid out by this committee in agreement with Dr. Zerhuni, and we all, at the end of December of that year, we all clasped hands and said that was a good thing. And we refrained from actually getting too much into the business of restructuring the NIH, which several people on the committee wanted to do, some areas where there, there might be duplication, and perhaps the, uh, the, the director should have greater authority. Uh, remember those articles when I first came on board, 29 fingers without a palm is not a, 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 a usable appendage. So. I just want to stress that this committee has done its work as far as the NIH is concerned. The problem is that the other committees in Congress haven't followed suit. And really, I would call upon the chairman to insist 
with the Speaker that the Appropriations Committee do its work in February when we do finally get around to doing the appropriations for last year and then ongoing during the year that we do the work required in the Appropriations Committee and that we provide you with the funding that we promised because if we don't do it this fiscal year, yeah, now you're down 15 percent of what you were promised of that increase. That's about $1.5 billion a year and like old Everett Dirksen said, pretty soon you're talking about real money. So with that, I, I, uh, I, again, I'm, I'm so grateful that you all are here. I, I think the NIH is the, the crown jewel in the, in the federal government, and it is a national treasure, and it is certainly something to be preserved. I'm not, I'm not sold on the idea of it being an economic stimulus engine. I do have to ask, Mr. King, what in the world are glycomimetics? Because I should know, and I don't. And I couldn't find it in your testimony, and I didn't look it up on Google last night. They're mimics of functional carbohydrates. As a physician, I'm sure you appreciate it. Well, that's what I would infer from the name. Then, and then, what is the association with sickle cell disease? If, if I may well, be so bold as to digress into science for a minute. The, the adhesive events associated with the sickle cell crisis are mediated by a mechanism that our drugs interfere with. So I'll be happy Excellent to work. Send, I'll send you more about it. <laughs> that, that's a fascinating field of, of study and, and just indicative of the type of basic research that is so critical for, for people who are afflicted with, with very, very onerous diseases and conditions. And Mr. Pollock, I just have to say, uh, you know, everyone remembers where they were during certain events in their life. I'll never forget the night driving home in 1993 after a hard day of seeing patients and hearing you and Donna Shalala talk about your vision for health care reform. It's what got, it, it made me politically active from that night. So although it was probably not your intention, I, I thank you for the, uh, the impetus and, and you were the catalyst for me suddenly becoming aware of my surroundings and, and the impact that Congress had on my life. Well, I'm going to yield back, Mr. Chairman, in the interest Doctor, of time. I have to say we're delighted that we helped to facilitate a portion of your career. I'm, I'm not sure that was a com a comp <laughs> but in any case, uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here today. Again, it's such an important issue and, you know, we would like to include um, the NIH in the stimulus at some point. So what you're... What you're the appropriations uh, process. Well, right? whatever. Oh. We'll look into it in any case because I think it has to be, it should be part of it in some way. So thank you again. Let me just remind um, members that they, well, I should tell you as well that, that you may get uh, written questions from members and those would be submitted to the clerk within the next 10 days. So you may get a notification that we have additional written questions. Uh, but without objection, this meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you. elected members of Congress began their orientation yesterday. As members of the